Um, hi, everybody. I seem to be having a problem tonight not connecting up to Facebook. I don't know exactly why. A little bit of an internet problem. Uh, hi, Kay. I see you here at this point. Don't know if anybody else is here. Yeah, I was watching uh, Biden's town hall tonight. Yeah, he sounded almost progressive. <laughs> he did do that. If you can share as much as you can, I haven't had a chance to share because of the technical difficulties. I'm trying to get back to my Facebook. It says my connection was interrupted. I do not know why. But hang in there with me. Uh, hey, Bonnie, are you getting me on Facebook? Yes, I'm watching. Okay. So I'm connected, so that's a start. I think the only people who are here are Kay and yourself. <laughs> that I seem to be having a difficult time logging into Facebook myself. I don't know why. Oh, there's Joanne. Hi, Joanne. How are you? Yeah, Joanne's waving. That's good. Hopefully my Facebook will clear up soon. keeps telling me my connection was interrupted to Facebook. I do not know why. Please bear with me while I go after these technical difficulties. I guess you can hear me, so that's good to begin with. Hmm. Well, my messenger's working properly. But I don't know why Facebook is having a problem. So let me go back to the beginning here. And let me get to Facebook through Messenger. Okay, please bear with me. I am still here. I am tinkering around. Had a cerebral angiogram, uh, um, angiogram today, so I may be leaving early. Very tired. Sorry to hear it, uh, Joanne. Hope it works out okay for you. Facebook is still loading up.
going to shift now to my direct my cable connection Let's see if that makes a difference there may be a bit of an interruption if there is please stay around while I do this I don't notice interruption at this point still trying to get into Facebook so I can share this I need to share it to make it public C says the town halls are terrible off soft softballs for Biden and the moderator at the Trump town hall is like a mad attack dog <laughs> Softballs for Biden and an attack dog for Trump. That's very funny. Thanks. I get the results next week. Anyone share to all the MMT groups? No, I don't think they have shared to the MMT groups yet. They may not be totally interested in this one at the MMT group since it's all about the courts. Okay, I'm not going to worry about what I see on Facebook and whether Facebook, oh, maybe Facebook has decided to come in. Nope, not yet. So I have a little anomaly. I can't actually see my Facebook page. So I can see you through my StreamYard. But I can't see you through Facebook, even though my messenger page is working. Anyway, what I'm going to do is start on the business of the day. The title is, is Court Reform on uh, the Ballot. And the answer to the question I posed is, I don't know if it's on the ballot, but I think maybe it should be. Because it's very important from the standpoint of the future of the country. Uh, the Amy Coney Barrett thing is only a symptom of a problem that's been going on for a long, long time, which the Democrats have largely ignored and allowed to happen over a period of 30 to 40 years. And the one who really made this clear at the hearings this week was uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, who was very good on the law. He's not so good on some other things like, for example, fiscal policy. Uh, but uh, um, he is very good on the law. An article appeared in Common Dreams and the article contained a transcript, a transcript of his uh, testimony. I shouldn't say testimony, okay, of the period when he was supposed to be questioning Amy Coney Barrett, but himself uh, uh, gave people a lecture of the important background dealing with the confirmation hearings. So I'm going to share the page with you now. And there it is. You should be seeing it. And I'm going to go through the transcript with you. It's going to take me quite some time, but it's very, very interesting. A very very good analysis and it's analysis that everybody should be familiar with I think
Okay, the article was done by Jake Johnson. The headline is, Look for Power in the Shadows. Watch Sheldon Whitehouse shine light on, quote, dark money operation behind the GOP Supreme Court takeover. And this was published on October 14th. And there's a graphic, Sheldon Whitehouse pointing to major groups in this network, the Federalist uh, Society, whose efforts uh, had been largely influenced or directly garnered, garnered, governed by Leonard, uh, 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 by Jay Leo for a very long time, the Judicial Crisis Network, and a number of legal groups funneling money into various kinds of lobbying operations. Anyway, Sheldon used his 30 minutes of allotted time during the hearings to outline a network okay, of influence, uh, but not to ask questions of Amy Coney Barrett. She was anyway repeatedly dodging the state, straightforward questions of other lawmakers. He gave a detailed presentation on the sprawling dark money operation fueling the right-wing takeover of the U.S. judicial system, not just the Supreme Court, but the lower courts as well. Displaying a number of visuals and flowcharts, the senator from Rhode Island traced the dizzying array of special interests and advocacy groups from the Koch network. to the Federalist Society, to the Judicial Crisis Network, to the Pacific Legal Foundation. That's what the PLC stood for in the graphic above. Coordinating and pouring money into the effort to confirm a Barrett and other far-right corporate-friendly judges committed to rolling back reproductive rights, voting rights, uh, by climate regulations, and more. So this not only applied to Barrett, it applied to Gorsuch, okay, it applied to Kavanaugh, it applied to earlier justices that came into the Supreme Court, Sam Alito, certainly, and Roberts. In fact, the Roberts Five, uh, that is to say, uh, Clarence Thomas and uh, Sam Alito and uh, Justice Roberts himself, and Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch, were all very much put there by this network, stretching from the Koch network to the Federalist uh, Society to the Judicial Crisis Network to the PLC. So here is the uh, here is the transcript of what Sheldon Whitehouse had to say. Thank you, Chairman Judge Barrett. You can take a bit of a breather on your return to the committee because what I want to do is go through with the people who are watching this. Now, the conversation that you and I had when we spoke on the telephone, you were kind enough to hear out a presentation that I made, and I intend to ask some questions in that area. But it doesn't make sense to ask questions if I haven't laid the predicate, particularly for viewers who are watching this. So, Sheldon Whitehouse wants to lay the predicate, okay, and he goes on, so I guess the reason that I want to do this is because people who are watching this need to understand that this small hearing room and the little TV box that you are looking at, the little screen that you are looking at, are a little bit like the frame of a puppet theater. I guess that applies to the big screens that some of us are looking at uh, right now. We have a relatively small one. We're still on a 32-inch and quite happy with it. We have a small apartment, so 32-inch doesn't throw us out of the apartment. But you get to the picture. It may not be such a little screen. It may be a very big screen for some of you. If you only look at what's going on in the puppet theater, you're not going to understand the whole story. You're not going to understand the real dynamic uh, uh, of uh, what is going on here, 
And you are certainly not going to understand forces outside of this room who are pulling strings and pushing sticks and causing the puppet theater to react. So first, let me say, why do I think outside forces are here pulling strings? Well, part of it is behavior. We have colleagues here who supported you, this uh, nominee, before there was a nominee. That's a little unusual, says Sheldon Whitehouse. We have, the, they said they were going to vote for the nominee before they knew it was going to be Amy Coney Barrett. There were two or three or four other possible alternatives, but they knew they were going to vote for the nominee. Sheldon continues, we have the political ram job that we've already complained of driving this process through at breakneck speed in the middle of a pandemic while the Senate is closed for safety reasons and while we're doing nothing about the COVID epidemic around us, we have some very awkward 180s from colleagues. Mr. Chairman, you figure in this. Our leader said back when it was Garland versus Gorsuch that of course, of course, the American people should have a say in the court's direction. Of course, of course, said Mitch McConnell. That's long gone. Senator Grassley said the American people shouldn't be denied a voice. That's long gone. Senator Cruz said you don't do this in an election year. That's long gone. And our chairman made his famous hold the tape promise. If an opening comes in the last year of President Trump's terms, we'll wait for the next election. That's gone too. So there is a lot of hard to explain hypocrisy and rush taking place here right now. In my experience around politics is that when you find hypocrisy in the daylight, look for power in the shadows. Now people say, well, what does all this matter? This is a political parlor game. It's no big deal. Well, there are some pretty high stakes here that we have been talking about here on our side. And I'll, I will tell you three of them right here. Roe versus Wade. Um, Obergefell. Or maybe it's Obergefell. I'm not sure how they pronounce it. And the o Obamacare cases. Here's the GOP platform. The Republican platform, the platform of my colleagues on the other side of this aisle, say that a Republican president will appoint judges who will reverse Roe, um, Obergefell, and the Obamacare cases. So if you have a family member with an interest in, su in some autonomy over their body under Roe v. Wade, the ability to have a marriage, have friends marry, have a niece or a daughter or a son, marry someone of their same sex they have, you've got a stake. And if you're one of the millions and millions of Americans who depend on the Affordable Care Act, you've got a stake. It's not just the platform. Over and over again, let's start by talking about the Affordable Care Act. Here's the president talking about his litigation. Okay, remember, this litigation was begun by the president of the United States that we are gearing up this nominee for for November 10th. In this litigation, he said, we want to terminate health care under Obamacare. That is the president's statement. So when we react to that, don't act as if we are making this stuff up. This is what President Trump said. This is what your party platform says. Reverse the Obamacare cases. Senator after senator, including many in this committee, filed briefs saying that the Affordable Care Act should be thrown out by courts. Why is it surprising for us to be concerned that you want this nominee what you want a nominees to do. One quick stop on NFIB versus uh, Sibelius, which is one of the original Affordable Care Act uh, cases, because a lot of this has to do with money. Uh, Sibelius was, uh, 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 Kathleen Sibelius, who was the head of HHS in the Obama administration, the first Obama administration. This is an interesting comparison. The Na National Federation of Independent uh, Businesses, until it filed the NFIB versus uh, Sibelius case, had its biggest donation ever, $21,000. In the year that it went to work on the Affordable Care Act, 10 wealthy donors gave $10 million. Somebody deserves a thank you. If it were me, I would probably have said gave 10 million. Hello, somebody. Somebody deserves a thank you. I would have put in hello, somebody there.
just to attract attention. So let's go on to Roe v. Wade. Same thing, same thing. The president has said that reversing Roe v. Wade will happen automatically because he is putting pro-life justices on the court. Why would we not take him at his word? The Republican Party platform says it will reverse Roe. Why would we not comment on that and take you at your word? Senators here, including Senator Hawley, uh, uh, have said, I will vote only for nominees who acknowledge that Roe versus Wade is wrongly decided, and they're pledged to vote for this nominee. Do the math. That's a really simple equation to run, says Sheldon. The Republican brief in June, uh, in um, June Medical, said Roe should be overruled. So don't act surprised when we ask questions about that, about whether that's what you are up to here. And finally, out in the ad world, you have spared yourself wisely, Judge Barrett. The Susan B. Anthony Foundation is running advertisements right now saying that you are set, you are set to give our pro-life country a court that it uh, deserves. Here is the ad with the voiceover. She said, she said, and then Roe, Obamacare cases and Obergefell, gay marriages. National Organization for, Ma for Marriage, the big group that proposes same-sex marriage, says in this proceeding, all our issues are at stake. The Republican platform says it wants to reverse um, Obergefell, and the Republican brief filed in the case said same-sex relationships don't fall within any constitutional protection. So when we say the stakes are high on this, it's because you have said the stakes are high on this. You have said that uh, that is what you want to do. So how are people going about doing it? What is the scheme here? Let me start with this one. In all cases, there's big anonymous money behind various lanes of activity. One lane of activity is through the conduit of the Federalist Society. It's managed by a guy who was managed by a guy named Leonard DeLeo. And it has taken over the selection of judicial nominees. That is the Federalist the society has. How do we know that to be the case? Because Trump has said over and over again, said that over and over again. His White House counsel said so. So we have an anonymously funded group controlling judicial selection run by this guy, Leonard Leo. Then in another lane, we have again anonymous funders running through something called the Judicial Crisis Network, the JCN which is run by Carrie Severino, and it is doing PR and campaign ads for Republican judicial nominees. It got $17 million, a single $17 million donation in the Garland-Gorsuch contest. Got another single $17 million donation to support Kavanaugh. Somebody, perhaps the same person, spent $35 million to influence the United States Supreme Court. Was it the Cokes, anyone? Tell me that's good, says Sheldon. Then over here you have a whole array of legal groups also funded by dark money, which have a different role. They bring cases to the court. They don't wind their way to the court, Your Honor. They get shoved to the court by these legal groups, many of which ask to lose below, that is in the lower courts, so they can get quickly to the court the Supreme Court, to get their business done there, and then they turn up in a chorus, an orchestrated chorus okay, of Amici. Uh, that is the plural, okay, of the amicus briefs, uh, friend of the court, uh, that are submitted, okay, to the court to try to support one side of the argument, okay, or the other. So the Latin title, okay, is an amicus brief, and the plural of that, okay, is Amici. Now, I've had a chance to have a look at this. And I was in a case, actually, as an amicus myself, the Consumer Financial Protection Board case. And in that case, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, um, ten, eleven amicus briefs filed. And every single one of them was a group funded by something called Donors Trust. All 11 of these groups were funded by one entity called Donors Trust. I added that to what Sheldon said. Sheldon again. 
Donors Trust is this gigantic identity scrubbing device for the right wing so that it says Donors Trust is the donor without whoever the real donor is. Because Donors Trust is a type of organization, um, the 501c4, uh, whose donors can be closed. Uh, so Donors Trust is the donor without whoever the real donor is. It doesn't have a business. It doesn't have a business plan. It doesn't do anything, says Sheldon. It's just an identity scrubber. And this group here, the Bradley Foundation, funded eight out of the 11 briefs. That seems weird to me when you have uh, amicus briefs coming in little flotillas that are funded by the same groups but nominally separate in the court. So I actually attached this to my brief as an appendix. Center for Media and Democracy saw it, and they did better work. They went on to say which foundations funded the brief writers in that CFPB case. Here is the Bradley Foundation for $5.6 million to those groups. Here's Donors Trust, $23 million to the brief writing groups. The grand total across all the donor groups was $68 million to the groups that were filing the amicus briefs, pretending that they were different groups. And it's not just in the Consumer Financial Protection Board case. You might sell, say, well, that was just a one-off. Here's Janus, the anti-labor case that had a long trail through the court, uh, 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 through Friedrichs and through Knox and through other decisions. And SourceWatch and ProPublica did some work about this. Here's Donors Trust and Donors Capital Fund. And here's the Bradley Foundation. And they total giving $45 million to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 groups that filed amicus briefs pretending to be different groups. And both of the lawyer groups in the case funded by Donors Trust funded by Bradley Foundation in the Janus case. This is happening over and over and over again, and it goes beyond just the briefs. It goes beyond just the amicus presentations. The Federalist Society, remember this group that is acting as the conduit, and Donald Trump has said is doing his judicial selection. They're getting money from the same foundation, from Donors Trust, $16.7 million, and the Bradley Foundation, $1.37 million, from the same group of foundations, total $33 million. So you can start to look at these and you can start to tie them together. The legal groups, all the same funders over and over again, bringing the cases and providing us orchestrated, orchestrated chorus of Amici. Then the same group also funds the Federalist Society over here. And he's pointing to his graphic with the Federalist Society on it. The Washington Post wrote a big expose about this, and that made Leonard Leo a little hot, a little bit like a burned agent. So he had to jump out, and he went off to go do anonymously funded voter suppression work. Guess who jumped in to take over the selection process, in this case for Judge Barrett? Carrie Severino made the hot. In other words, she was with the Judicial Network, and she made the hop over to the main organization orchestrating the thing, which was the Federalist Society. And Sheldon says, so once again, ties right in together. So Center for Media Democracy did a little bit more research. Here's a Bradley Foundation memo that they've published. The Bradley Foundation is reviewing a grant application asking for money for this orchestrated uh, um, amicus process and what do they say in the staff recommendation it is important to orchestrate their word not mine important to orchestrate high caliber um, amicus efforts before the court they also note that Bradley has done previous philanthropic investments in the actual underlying legal actions so Bradley is funding what do they call philanthropically investing in the underlying legal action and then giving money to groups to show up in the orchestrated chorus of Amici. That can't be good. And it goes on because they also found this email. This email comes from an individual at the Bradley Foundation and it asks our friend, uh, Leonard Leo, 
who used to run the selection process, is there a 501c3 nonprofit to which Bradley could direct any support of the two Supreme Court um, anarchist projects other than Donors Trust? Uh, you see, they wanted another group in there to hide things. So, and they wanted in this case to make it a 501c3 nonprofit. They're more transparent than the 501c4s. I don't know why they wanted to avoid the reliable identity scrubber donors trust, but for some reason they did, says Sheldon. So Leonard Leo writes back, maybe they were looking for a little more respectability, Sheldon. So Leonard Leo writes back on Federalist Society address. So don't tell me that it isn't Federalist, a, a Federal Society business on Federalist Society. On his address, he writes back, Yes, send it to the Judicial Education Project, which could take and allocate the money. And guess who works for the Judicial Education Project? Carrie Severino, who also helped select this nominee running the Trump Federalist Society selection process. All this time, by the way, if you saw the, uh, the presentation, the camera shifts occasionally, more than occasionally, actually, shifts uh, very frequently to Amy Coney Barrett, who was intent, intent on Sheldon Whitehouse and his presentation. And it looks like she's just staring, unblinking at him. I couldn't tell whether those were daggers coming from her eyes or not, but she gave the full focus of her attention while Sheldon was going through this to Sheldon Whitehouse. And I do think those were daggers. So the connections abound. In the White Washington Post article, they point out that Judicial Crisis Network's office is on the same hallway in the same building as the Federalist Society. And when they send their reporter to talk to somebody at the JCN, Somebody from the Federalist Society came down to let them up into the building, okay, into the office network. This more and more looks like it's not three schemes, but it's one scheme with the same funders selecting judges, funding campaigns for the judges, and then showing up in court in these orchestrated uh, amicus flotillas to tell the judges what to do. Nice choice of words there, Sheldon. Flotillas, I love that. On the JCN, you've got the Leonard Leo connection, obviously. She hopped in to take over for him with Federalist Society. You've got the campaigns that I've talked about where they take $17 million contributions. That's a big check to write, $17 million to campaign for Supreme Court nominees. No idea who that is or what they got for it. You've got briefs that she wrote. The Republican senators filed briefs in that um, NFIB case signed by Mrs. by Ms. Uh, Severino. Sorry, she's a Ms., not a Mrs. I mean, she may be a Mrs., but we're addressing her as Ms. anyway. The woman who helped choose this nominee has written briefs for Republican senators attacking the ACA. Don't say the ACA is not an issue here. And by the way, the Judicial Crisis Network funds the Republican Attorneys General. It funds RAGA, the Republican Attorneys General Association, and it funds individual Republican Attorneys General. And guess who the plaintiffs are in the Affordable Care Act case? Republican Attorneys General. They're the plaintiffs. Trump joined them because he didn't want to defend, so he's in with the Republican Attorneys General. But here's the Judicial Crisis Network campaigning for Supreme Court nominees, writing briefs for senators against the Affordable Care Act, supporting the Republicans who are bringing this case, and leading the selection process for this nominee. Here is the page off the brief. Here is where they are. Of Mitch McConnell, and on through the list. Senator Collins, Senator Cornyn, Senator Hervin, Senator who's still here? Mark Rubio. It's a huge assortment of Republican senators who Carrie Severino wrote a brief for against the Affordable Care Act. 
So this is a, to me, pretty big deal. I've never seen this around any court that I've ever been involved with, where there's this much dark money and this much influence being used. Here's how the Washington Post summed it up. This is a conservative, this is a quote, a conservative activist behind the scenes campaign to remake the nation's courts, unquote. And it is a 250 million dark money operation. $250 million is a lot of money to spend if you're not getting anything for it. So that raises the question, what are they getting for it? Well, I showed the slide earlier on the Affordable Care Act and on Obersfeld and on Roe v. Wade. That's where they lost. But with another judge, that could change. That's where the contest is. That's where the Republican Party platform tells us to look on how they want um, judges to rule, to reverse Roe, to reverse Obamacare cases, and to reverse Obersfeld and take away gay marriage. That is their stated objective and plan. Why not take them at their word? But there is another piece of it, and that is not what's ahead of us, but what's behind us. What's behind us is now 80 cases, Mr. Chairman, 80 cases of the Chief Justice Roberts that have these characteristics. One, they were decided five to four by a bare majority. Two, the five to four majority was partisan in the sense that not one Democratic appointee joined the five. I refer to that group, uh, the majority, as the, quote, Roberts Five, unquote. It changes a little bit, as with Justice Scalia's death, for instance, but there's been a, quote, uh, a steady, quote, Roberts Five, unquote, that has delivered now 80 of these decisions, and the last characteristic of them is that there is an identifiable Republican donor interest in those cases. And in every single case, that donor interest won. It was an 80 to 0, 5 to 4 partisan route ransacking. I find that part of the argument very, very compelling. 80 of these decisions. And it's important to look at where those cases went because they're not about big public issues like getting rid of the Affordable Care, Affordable Care Act, undoing Roe v. Wade, and undoing same-sex marriage. They're about power. And if you look at those 80 decisions, they fall into four categories over and over and over again. One, unlimited and dark money and politics. Citizens uh, United is the famous one, but it's continued um, but since with the McCutcheon case, and we've got one coming up now. Always the five for unlimited money in politics, never protecting against uh, dark money in politics, despite the fact that they said in the CU case that uh, it was going to be transparent. And who wins when you allow unlimited dark money in politics? A very small group. The ones who have unlimited money to spend and a motive to spend it in politics, like the Koch brothers, like Sheldon Adelson, like the Mercers, like, uh, I don't know, maybe Larry Ellison, you know, the people who have huge amounts of money, the Walmart family. They win. Everybody else loses. And if you're looking at who might be behind this, let's talk about people with unlimited money to spend and a motive to do it. I should have mentioned uh, Bezos and Zuckerberg. We'll see how that goes. Next. In other words, the second category. Next. Knock the civil jury down. Whittle it down to a nub. The civil jury was in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, in our darn Declaration of Independence. But it's annoying to big corporate powers because you can swagger your way as a big corporate power through Congress. You can go and tell the president you put money into to elect what to do. He will put your stooges at the APA. It's all great until you get to the civil jury. 
because they have an obligation, as you know, Judge Barrett, they have an obligation under the law to be fair to both parties, irrespective of their size. You can't bribe them. You're not allowed to. It's a crime to tamper with the jury. It's standard practice to tamper with the Congress. He's, of course, he's absolutely right. There's open buying of Congress through all these campaign donations. And they make decisions going on. They make decisions based on the law. If you're used to being the boss and swaggering your way around the political side, you don't want to be answerable before a jury. And so one after another, these 85 to 4 decisions have knocked down, whittled away at the civil jury, a great American institution. In other words, excluding civil juries from more and more kinds of litigation. Or more and more cases. Third, first was unlimited dark money. Second was the mean and diminished the civil jury. Third is weakened regulatory agencies. A lot of this money, I'm convinced, is polluter money. The coke industries is a polluter. The fossil fuel industry is a polluter. Who else would be putting buckets of money into this and wanting to hide who they are behind donors, trusts, or other schemes? And what are, if you're a big polluter, what do you want? You want weak regulatory agencies. You want ones that you can box up and run over to Congress and get your friends to fix things for you in Congress. Over and over and over again, these decisions are targeted regulatory agencies to weaken their independence and weaken their strength. And if you're a big polluter, a weak agency is your idea of a good day. And the last thing is in politics, in voting. Why on earth the court made a decision, a factual decision, not something appellate courts are ordinarily supposed to make, as I understand it, Judge Barrett, the factual decision that nobody needed to worry about minority voters in pre-clearance states being discriminated against or that legislators would try to knock back their ability to vote. These five made that finding in Shelby County against bipartisan legislation from both houses of Congress, hugely passed on no factual record. They just decided that that was a problem that was over on no record with no basis. The problem he's talking about here okay, is the discrimination problem in these pre-clearance Southern states, if you remember, Shelby County versus um, Alabama, that was the state that overturned the requirement in the Voting Rights Act that the southern states that had been guilty of discrimination for so many years had to get any changes in their voting laws pre-cleared by the Department of Justice. Shelby County versus Alabama ended that, gutted the Voting Rights Act, I believe that was also in 2010, by the Roberts Five. Anyway, going on with what uh, Sheldon has to say. They just decided that was a problem that was over on no record with no basis because it got them to result that we then saw what followed. State after state passed voter suppression laws one so badly targeting African-Americans that two courts said it was surgically, surgically tailored to get after minority voters. Uh, two remarks on this, okay, at this point. Giving a dissenting opinion in Shelby County versus Alabama, uh, Justice uh, RBG said, that this was like a situation where you've gone out time after time after time uh, with an umbrella to protect you against uh, the rain. Okay, And you say, oh, gee, I've stayed dry. I mean, I've been protected against uh, the rain. So since I've stayed dry all this time, it follows that I don't really need the umbrella anymore. And she said, that's what this decision um, is like. On no evidence whatsoever, without a basis whatsoever, the majority is theorizing that protection against discrimination in these pre-clearance states is not ready. 
is is not is no longer necessary. That that protection is no longer necessary. So we are gutting the Voting Rights Act and letting these states participate in the same way as all the other states in the union. Within hours of that decision hitting the streets, um, but Texas had passed new voting rights um, 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 legislation targeted at minority communities in Texas. They had the legislation already. They were just waiting for the decision by the Supreme Court and it came down. And the first piece of evidence that the Supreme Court had made a terrible mistake. I won't even call it a mistake. I'm sure it was deliberate on the part of the Roberts Five. Okay, and not a mistake. What it was is the first piece of evidence giving the lie to their assumption that protection against discrimination in those states was no longer needed. And then what followed, according to Sheldon Whitehouse, state after state passed voter suppression laws. One, so badly targeting African Americans that two courts said it was surgically, surgically tailored to get after minority voters. And gerrymandering, the other great control, bulk gerrymandering, where you go into a state like the Red Map uh, Project did, that was a Republican project, to try to gerrymander and gain control. And you pack Democrats so tightly into a few districts in Ohio and Pennsylvania, that is, that all the others become Republican majority districts. And in those states, you send a delegation to Congress that has a huge majority of uh, Republican members, like 13 to 5, as I recall. I believe this happened in Pennsylvania. In a state where the five the party of the five actually won the popular vote. In other words, Democrats had a greater popular vote for members of the House than Republicans had. Yet Republicans ended up with 13 representatives and the Democrats with only five representatives. Sheldon proceeds, you sent a delegation to Congress that is out of step with the popular vote of that state and court after court figured out how to solve that and the Supreme Court said no. In other words, these decisions in these individual cases got uh, legal action in state after state and court after court changed the gerrymander, came up with a formula for changing the gerrymander so things were more fair. And the case went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to take an interest in that question. They decided not even to take an interest in that question. In all these areas where it's about political power for big special interests and people who want to fund campaigns and people who want to get their way through politics without actually showing up, doing it behind Donors Trust and other groups, doing it through these schemes over and over and over again, you see the same thing. Yeah, what you see is oligarchy. 80 decisions, Judge Barrett. 80 decisions, an 80 to 0 sweep. I don't think you've tried cases, but in Sutton, no, she hasn't. She's never been a trial lawyer. The issue is bias and discrimination. If you're making a bias case as a trial lawyer, okay, um, Lindsey Graham is a hell of a good trial lawyer. If he wanted to make a bias case, Dick Durbin is a hell of a good trial lawyer. If they wanted to make a bias case, I think that Sheldon Whitehouse is a hell of a good trial lawyer too. Then they could show an 80 to 0 pattern. A, that's admissible, and B, I'd love to make that argument to, to the jury. I'd be really hard pressed to be the lawyer saying no, 80 to, 80 to 0 is just a bunch of flukes. All 5 to 4, all partisan, all this way. So something is not right around the court. Something is not right around the court. 
or as Shakespeare said, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. And dark money has a lot to do with it, says Sheldon. Special interests have a lot to do with it. Donors trust and whoever is hiding behind donors trust has a lot to do with it. And the Bradley Foundation um, orchestrating, okay, it's Amici, over at the court has a lot to do with it. So I thank you, Judge Barrett, for listening to me now for a second time. And I think this gives you a chance for you and I to tee up an interesting conversation tomorrow. And I thank my colleagues for hearing me out. So, wasn't that a really magnificent thing to present to a national TV audience? I'm afraid too few people have seen it or have sat through it or have read uh, the transcript as I just had to you. But it was a very, very damning case. Now, Ted Cruz responded afterwards, and he said, oh, the Democrats do the same thing. They do the same thing. This is not restricted to only one party. The only problem is there's nothing like this effort on the Democrat side. Ted Cruz lied again, like he always does. There are small efforts on the Democratic side okay, to try to counter this, but there's no 250 million. There's more like a few million. And there's no complex network of groups. And there's no main group that's similar uh, to Donors Trust. And there's no group on the Democratic side, uh, side familiar with the, uh, like the Federalist Society, similar to the Federalist Society. That's restricted to the Republican side. They have the machinery to do this. The Democrats don't have the machinery to do this because they haven't been making extraordinary efforts to control the court. We can ask why not. That's another interesting question. Why haven't they been defending the liberal side on the Supreme Court? They haven't been. Over these last 30 to 40 years, they haven't been. What's been happening is they watch the Republicans nominate highly partisan justices every time, starting with Bork, I think. Every time, these highly partisan justices. And as it goes forward, and the Democrats get a chance to nominate someone, they nominate someone who is likely to be a fair justice, more towards the center. Then the Republicans come back and they nominate more right-wing justices. And the Democrats strive to be reasonable and to put in fair justices. Then comes Umba Sotomayor. Sotomayor, pretty centrist. Okay, and um, 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 Elena Kagan is the next one. She also, centrist. Now the most anti-corporate justice on the court, not very anti-corporate, is probably Sotomayor. But Kagan is reasonably friendly to corporations, certainly fair. And, of course, all the Republican justices are always deciding cases in favor of the corporate side. That is what they do. That is what they do. So let's go over to the next one now. I see not too many people are here, not surprising. I thought that might happen. But this is worth doing, so I'm going to do it regardless. Just to keep the context quite clear, 
I won't spend much time on this article. It's from Truth Out. And basically what it has to say is it's by Barbara uh, uh, Koppel, or Keppel, October 13, 2020. She says, um, 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 if Americans want transparency as they should, they've got it. Judge Amy Coney Barrett's record of attacks on civil rights, workers' rights, anti-discrimination men, anti-discrimination measures and consumer protections is crystal clear. Though she's just 48 years old, she has a phenomenally large legal footprint. And her record does not bode well for the Affordable Care Act and many of the rights won over the past half century. Maybe for many of the rights won over the past century. That may be an underestimate because Amy Coney Barrett may be a threat um, but to Medicare she may be a threat to, to Medicaid. She may be a threat even to Social Security. She may be a threat to minimum wage legislation. I don't know. She's awfully corporate. Anyway, the Democrats critiqued the Republicans' rush to approve Barrett before the election, chiding them for ignoring the COVID-19 catastrophe for which state and local governments, healthcare facilities, and individuals need the Senate to send funds as they struggle to survive the economic fallout and physical assault on their lives. And uh, mainly, however, uh, what the Democrats did was focus on Barrett's record, which they argued matters massively. Indeed, her vote may be the one that um, 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 determines the outcome of the case. The Supreme Court will hear November 10th, California versus Texas, which Republicans with the president's boost have brought to repeal the Affordable Care Act. The truth of the Democrats insisted is that Trump picked Barrett because he believes she will overturn the ACA. As Diane Feinstein noted, quote, the president has promised to appoint justices who will vote to dismantle that law. Anyway, this goes through her record. Okay, the Republicans, of course, have ignored her record. Instead, they praised her intellect, her competence, her faith, her family, and her high approval ratings from her law students. Oddly, they assisted, okay, the Democrats are ignoring her record. That's Karl Rove. Although discussing her record is precisely what the Democrats were doing. Uh, Karl Rove always said to accuse the opposition on their strength. Play to their strength. Try to knock down that strength. And try to project what you're not doing onto, uh, uh, what you're doing onto them. Like okay, the Republicans were insisting, okay, uh, that it was the Democrats ignoring her record, although discussing her record is precisely what Democrats were doing and precisely what the Republicans were ignoring in favor of discussing her intellect, her competence, her faith, her family, and her high approval ratings from her law students. That's not the relevant record when it comes to confirmation for the Supreme Court. While the press has often focused on Barrett's religious belief and her family's membership in People of Praise, a small Catholic group that some call a cult, it's her decisions and dissents, along with her articles and speeches, that leave little doubt about her future judgments. Barrett has firm opinions about access to health care, worker and consumer protections, immigrant rights, gun laws, and criminal uh, legal reforms, positions that are 180 degrees away from the legal giant she seeks to replace, whom all the Republican senators took pains to praise. Barrett is even to the right of judges appointed by Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, whose judicial decisions she has criticized. While she hasn't ruled on same-sex marriage or sexual identity, her thoughts on these subjects has surfaced in other venues. So anyway, she's said that judi uh, her judicial philosophy is the same as uh, Scalia's. In one talk at Jacksonville University 2016, she mentioned his name at least 20 times. Uh, 
Kamala Harris insisted, quote, President Trump is attempting to roll back Americans' rights for decades to come. Every American must understand that with this nomination, equal justice under law is at stake. Uh, voting rights are at stake. Workers' rights are at stake. Consumer rights are at stake. The right to safe and legal abortion is at stake. And holding corporations accountable is at stake. And there's so much more, unquote. And then it goes over what she did on the Affordable Care Act and what she uh, uh, has written in relation to abortion rights and contraception. As I said, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I commend this article to you. It's very clear on Barrett's record with respect to other things I've already mentioned, and LGBTQ protections as well. Um, um, age discrimination, in the case where a 58-year-old man applied for a job, it was turned down in favor of a 29-year-old employee with less experience. Judge Barrett, with two other Trump-appointed judges, said the Age Discrimination Employment Act did not protect him. Why? The act would only apply if the man was already an employee competing for a job against a younger employee. It did not apply, she said, to someone applying for a job for the first time. A dissenting judge called this baffling since the act's main goal was to prevent age discrimination in hiring. The AARP weighed in saying okay, the decision, quote, takes us back to 1967 when age limits were common. So age discrimination, on top of everything else, age discrimination. I mean... I really would not be hired by places because I'm 81 um, I'm, uh, right now, even with that law in place. But in light of this decision, of course, uh, that law wouldn't do me any good anyway, right? In another case, Judge Barrett said a driver for, for a national delivery company was who asked for overtime wages did not have the right to them since he didn't drive his vehicle across state lines. Thus, he was not protected by the Federal Arbitration Act and would have to apply his case through an arbitration process which notoriously favors firms over workers. The driver's lawyer chided the court, quote, certainly when Congress enacted the act, it never foresaw it would be used to stop drivers from challenging their employer's systematic violation of wage uh, laws. So there it is depriving people of overtime wages to deprive people of overtime wages you think she's going to uphold let's say a change in the minimum wage law i mean what happens if we suddenly jump to 15 dollars an hour or higher what would she do then she probably invalidated on grounds okay, that minimum wage laws are unconstitutional and not only throw the increase out, but even the current $7.25 minimum wage out. Well, actually, that might be a good result because then we could get a federal job guarantee passed. If we got a federal job guarantee passed and we paid... Uh, $15 an hour at the lowest wage with cost adjustments across the whole country, and the federal government was willing to pay that to anybody who wanted it, that would serve as a de facto minimum wage. Of course, Barrett would probably then uh, go on some kind of crazy kick and say the federal government cannot pay more than the lowest wage in the marketplace, because if it does, it constitutes a de facto minimum wage which he had already declared unconstitutional. Okay, so they want to go and confirm this freakazoid, right? There's more. There's gun control. She hasn't weighed in on climate stuff. They tried to get her to state an opinion about it. Unsuccessfully unsuccessfully <laughs> okay i'm gonna stop sharing that so these are the problems okay now i want to go to the remedies boy 
I've really got no numbers, uh, but low numbers tonight. People must really want to watch uh, Joe Biden. How long is that town hall supposed to last? Anyway, here's an article from the American Prospect. It's called Supersize the Supreme Court to Save It. It's by Adam J. Levitin. Done on October 12, 2020. It's a new way of thinking about depoliticizing the judiciary. So Adam Levitin believes that the problem here, the central problem okay, with the Supreme Court, is that it's become too, um, 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 too politicized. Now, I would say the problem is that it's become too politicized plus also too conservative because the majority sitting on the Supreme Court now is five to four conservative and about to come six to three conservative. So depoliticizing it might help that particular situation. But let's just say we're facing a situation where we need a progressive Supreme Court because of all the changes we have to go about making in our legal structure to cope with the climate crisis in order to deliver a Green New Deal. And in order to do a Medicare for All bill, and in order to do uh, the kind of public housing infrastructure we need, you know all the various things we need. Just look at Bernie Sanders' platform. <laughs> Most of it was in there. Okay, so you can look at that and get the picture about what we need. Now, obviously, we need a Supreme Court that's going to look at at those changes in a sympathetic way. That's going to try to find a way to square those changes with the Constitution as it currently exists. Okay. Let's just say that that's our situation because I think it is. We have 10 years to do something about the, the climate. We don't have time to screw around, frankly, with an uncooperative Supreme Court. That is not something we have time for. So I'm going to share this article with you, though, and you can consider how he wants to depoliticize the Supreme Court. Of course, we've discussed court packing before. Choice of the court size rests with Congress, which has historically opted for anywhere between six and ten um, justices. It is indisputable that Congress can change the number of justices on the Supreme Court. Okay. His suggestion is we can depoliticize the Supreme Court by supersizing it. Okay. Now I'd say we can also deconservativize the Supreme Court by supersizing it as well, um, depending upon how we go about appointing the new justices. But he says, instead of partisan court packing by adding just enough seats to change the ideological balance of the court, Congress should affect a wholesale makeover of the court by adding two dozen more seats. He wants to add 24 more seats, creating a Supreme Court with 33 justices in it. Now, I thought that I was being radical, suggesting a change, adding six more justices to the court, creating a 15 justice court. Anyway, let's go on. This change would uh, dramatically improve both the political climate of nominations and the way the court operates, all while staying within the confines of the Constitution says, the problems with the current system is that it is winner take all. If one party gets a majority of the seats on the court, it controls it. Not just until the next election, but potentially for a generation. 
in a polarized political environment, this sort of winner-take-all system is a recipe for brutal confirmation fights that undermine the court's appearance of impartiality and uh, legitimacy. We can change the Supreme Court from a high-stakes winner-take-all contest to a lower-stakes contest that more accurately reflects the undulations of electoral outcomes. If the court was substantially expanded to, say, 33 justices, it would be too large for all justices to hear every case. Instead, the court would have to sit in smaller panels of randomly assigned justices, just as the circuit courts of appeals already do, if two panels reach different rulings in separate cases that dealt with the same issue. The split could be resolved through a hearing before a third, larger, on bank panel, but still not the whole 33-member court, whose ruling would bind subsequent panels the same way the court is bound by its own past rulings today. The precedent, in other words, the role of precedent in the court. A larger court sitting in randomly assigned panels would create a more even distribution of odds that either party would be in the majority on any given panel. The odds would change depending on electoral outcomes. But even if a majority of justices were appointed by one party, there would be no guarantee that any randomly assigned panel would reflect uh, that particular majority. For example, even if the court consisted of 18 Republicans and 15 Democrats, there would still be a 41% chance that the majority of any random panel of five justices would be Democrats. This sort of uncertainty about panel composition is precisely what would turn down the political heat. A larger court would also lower the stakes of any individual nomination. Instead of a single seat shifting control to court, it would have only a small effect on the odds of either party having a majority on any given panel. In the example above, the shift of an additional seat from Democrats to Republicans would still leave a 35% chance of a Democratic majority on a panel. Moreover, with a larger court, turnover would be more frequent, so a nomination would not be a rare generational event. If you want to depoliticize the court, I think this is a reasonable idea. He goes on to say, expanding the court would also have other benefits. A larger court enables appointment of a more diverse bench that better reflects America, not just in terms of demographics, but also in viewpoint. The current high stakes nomination process creates pressure on both parties to stack the court with ultra-partisan nominees. By lowering the stakes for a nomination, a larger court makes it possible to appoint uh, uh, nominees all along the ideological spectrum. And more frequent turnovers on a large court would mean that its composition would better reflect current voter preferences rather than the dead hand control of uh, uh, Senate majorities from decades ago. Further, moving to a panel system would enable separation of the process by which the court decides what cases to hear from the actual adjudication of these ca of those cases. Under the current system, the short court chooses what which cases to hear in a given term among thousands of potential uh, lower court uh, rulings. This process creates an opportunity for justices to pick cases based on how they want to rule. Just as no man should be able to pick his judges, so should no judge be able to pick her case. If the justices picking which cases to hear did not know which justices would be ruling on those cases, the case selection process itself would be depoliticized. That sounds like a good thing, but we got to talk about this some more. Unlike proposals to change life tenure for justices, or have some justices chosen by other justices, or to involuntarily reconfirm justices to lower courts, or to impose supermajority voting requirements, supersizing of the court would be on rock-solid constitutional footing. The Constitution is silent about 
the size of the Supreme Court. The choice of the court size rests with Congress, which has historically opted for anywhere between six and ten um, the justices. Congress can expand the court by as many seats as it wants, and because the Constitution mandates life tenure for justices, the subsequent Congress cannot readily reverse an expansion. Expanding the court to 33 seats would lock in the structure and depoliticize the court once and for all and without need to resort to a constitutional amendment. So he wants to continue life tenure for justices, but he thinks depoliticizing it, having 33 justices on there, would depoliticize the court uh, once and for all without need to resort to uh, an amendment. He points to something by Daniel Epps and Ganesh uh, uh, on, 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 on Sita Naren. I have proposed an even more radical expansion to the Supreme Court by making all 171 courts of appeal judges also simultaneously associate justices of the Supreme Court. The basic thrust of Epps okay, and Sita Marin's proposal is similar to mine. Expanding the court changes how it operates and uh, would uh, uh, necessitate the use of a panel system but their proposal would have the collateral effect of locking in the current composition of the courts of appeals, where a third of the judges are Trump appointees. With child justice panels, this means a 60% chance that any random panel would have a Republican majority and a 15% chance that it would consist entirely of Trump appointees. The result would be a substantial initial partisan advantage um, for Republicans in a reform meant to make the court uh, less partisan. The allocation of the bevy of new court seats would be something for Congress and the president to work out informally, much, way the, much the way the Court of Appeals of nomination process works already. But there's a fair and efficient bipartisan way to do it. Let uh, the Democrats and Republicans each pick half of the new seats. Let each side put up a slate okay, of nominees and give the other side a limited number of strikes, much like in a jury selection. Then for the remaining names on the slates, um, um, allow half to be voted on without a filibuster and half subject to a filibuster. The process would ensure that half of the nominees would be consensus appointments, and while each party would be able to get some partisans on the court, they would be partially neutralized by the panel system. In this arrangement, neither party is guaranteed an enduring advantage, and both sides can appeal to voters' gut sense okay, a fair play. The politicizing a nomination process will not remove politics from the court entirely. Some level of politics okay, is inevitable in law, uh, but political outlooks will be a factor in the selection of justices, and a supersized court will continue to struggle with political cases like Bush v. Gore. Uh, but political decisions, however, have even uh, less legitimacy when they're produced by a naked partisan majority of justices uh, selected during a previous political uh, uh, epoch. The random panel draw at greater turnover in a supersized court mean that uh, decisions in political cases are not preordained or subject to a dead hand uh, but political control. The winner of today's ruling might lose a follow-up case before a different panel tomorrow. It's not a perfect system, but it's a better and fairer one than the, uh, the uh, current winner-take-all approach. Um, I agree. I think it's better than the current winner-take-all approach. But um, I also think that, first of all, the idea of having the filibuster involved in this kind of assumes that we're going to retain uh, the filibuster. I am not for retaining the filibuster. Joe Biden has said that he's not for retaining the filibuster. Uh, Bernie Sanders was a little less definite about this, but in general, uh, the filibuster is just um, anti-democratic. Constitution calls for the Senate to be run in a democratic way. 
and for majority vote in the Senate, okay, to be ruling. I want to go back to that. I don't want to mess with the filibuster anymore. Historically, it's been a travesty for legislation, and we can't afford to have the filibuster on, on, on anymore when we're entering a time when things have to happen fast, where we have to get hold of the climate problem really, really fast. We have no time at all to waste with filibusters. Okay, in any process. Further, when it comes to depoliticizing the Supreme Court, I wonder if depoliticizing the Supreme Court, okay, is a good um, uh, idea. Yes, uh, the lower courts are now stacked with Republican nominees, but we're not here just looking at a Democrat versus Republican split. We are looking at a liberal conservative split which is not the same thing. For decades, the Supreme Court has been getting packed with conservatives by a Republican Party who is trying to pick justices of a particular kind as that party moves further and further to the right and is further and further controlled by moneyed interests and is further and further opposed to the interests of poorer people and middle class people and most people even until you get to the top one percent it speaks for the top one percent that is the situation and with the federal court system full of people staffed with this in mind i think one thing we have to do is greatly expand the size of the circuit courts of the lower courts greatly expand the size and stack these courts with liberal majorities right now and do the same with the Supreme Court because we need a progressive majority on these courts. We need rapid change right now. We don't have the luxury of slow and gradual change. Yes, expanding the court to 33 seats would create a depoliticized court. No doubt there would be more justices appointed who would rule uh, in the absence okay, of ideology or with as little ideology as possible. Everybody has some ideology, but they would tend more to judge cases um, on the merits without specific donors in mind. But it would not necessarily be good at this point to have the Supreme Court full of centrist justices who don't have any ideology. Maybe you need justices that have a strong, when it comes to green ideology right now, because that's an existential threat. Climate change is an existential threat. So maybe it's a good idea to expand to 33 justices. I don't know. I'd rather start by expanding the Supreme Court to 15 justices by adding another six. And then I'd like to consider what to do in each of the other uh, courts. But I'd like to add enough justices to every circuit court of the appeals to get rid of the conservative majorities on those circuit courts where they exist. And I think we need to have this done fast. I think we need to have this done by a Biden administration, that we need wholesale packing of the courts. Yes, the Republicans will scream this is illegitimate, but they've packed the courts over 30 to 40 years. The courts are well and truly packed right now. And that packing is not good for society and is inconsistent with the majority that is about to be swept into office and the majority that is growing. We can look to the future. We know what young people want. We know what young people are looking towards. We know they're concerned about their survival. We know they're concerned about their world. 
we know that they have to solve the climate crisis, that we and they together have to solve the climate crisis, and then they have to maintain the solution to change the, to re even reverse the climate changes that have occurred. We can't have a Supreme Court that is not in sympathy with that, and we can't have lower level circuit courts that are not in sympathy with that either. We have to make these changes. I'm sorry. Sometimes a revolution is necessary. And if it's a peaceful revolution through voting, as we might have it now, so much the better. It's a peaceful resolution. A peaceful revolution. Now, certainly, there's going to be resistance. There's going to be reaction. There are going to be people shocked and scandalized when all this is going on. But with Medicare for all, with federal job guarantees, with a new strong cooperative sector in the economy, with much better wages for people across the board, with a much stronger safety net, a lot of the angst will be eased. A lot of the opposition to changes will be diffused. The Green Dune New Deal will be popular. It will be successful as the original New Deal is. And the changes will be popular for a generation, maybe for more, as long as the climate crisis lasts. So I think looking for a depoliticized court may be good within reason, but not on fundamentals, not on those fundamentals in relation to the Green New Deal and in relation to the social safety net and in relation to the various kinds of justice we have to see here. Racial justice, climate justice, environmental justice, green justice, housing justice, fair criminal justice, real criminal justice. Not criminal policing, criminal justice. We need that. We need all these different things. And we need a cure to inequality too. And we can't wait very long for these things any longer because the problems have become so acute that we are at the point of fascism now. And we cannot stay there. We have to roll back fascism. That doesn't just involve defeating Donald Trump. That involves calling a halt to the underlying conditions that have created Donald Trump. That falls to the Biden administration too. I know that many of us are cynical about what the Biden administration will do. I have my problems, lots of problems with the Biden administration too, and I'm cynical about what it will do also. That doesn't change what we have to do, which is to hassle the hell out of it, struggle with it day after day, as hard as we can, in every way we can, to get it to act in the way that the United States needs. Let us hope Joe Biden warms to the task. But if he doesn't, okay, and even if he does, there's something he has to do right now. And that gets us to our fourth piece tonight. And so I'm going to share the screen once again. And this is a short article from the, uh, the American Prospect. This won't take very long to go through. Uh, this is by Bob uh, Kuttner, or uh, Robert Kuttner, and he says Biden needs to give a major speech on court expansion, and I completely agree with him. It's important to do court expansion. He says Joe Biden has been getting pummeled by Republicans, both for the demands of many Democrats to expand the Supreme Court and for ducking the question of whether it supports the idea. He can blunt these attacks by facing the issue head on. Expanding in the court is a legitimate idea because Republicans have been engaging in court backing for decades.
For starters, they've imposed extreme ideological litmus tests on their own court appointees and shamelessly delayed or blocked democratic appointments. They were vicious in blocking Obama's appointees to every level of the judiciary, abusing everything from the norm of senatorial courtesy to the filibuster. They also engaged in bargaining with the Obama White House, signaling that centrist nominees would have an easier time. But uh, infamously, they denied one of those centrist Obama nominees, Merrick Garland, even the courtesy of a hearing on the grounds that the next appointee should be named by the next president. Garland was nominated on March 16th when Obama's term had 10 months to run. Amy Coney Barrett was nominated by Trump on September 26th when Trump's term had less than four. But that was then. The fact is that the Supreme Court has been different sizes at different periods of American history. The Republicans think the size of a court is sacrosanct. Why do they try the gambit of proposing a uh, legislation to shrink the size of the country's second most important appellate court, the D.C. Circuit, from 11 to 2008? I, I'm sorry, uh, from 11 to 8 in 2013, other than to lock in a conservative uh, majority? We also need to enlarge federal district and appeals courts, which have not been increased in Jim, since Jimmy Carr's presidency, despite population growth of some 40%. In other words, the federal district and appeals courts perhaps should be expanded by 40%, an expansion consistent with the population growth we've had since Jimmy Carter's presidency. Biden needs to explain all this to voters. He will win points for his candor and will at least partly diffuse the issue. The term, quote, court packing, unquote, has been repeatedly used by the media in a ways that echoes and reinforces Republican talking points. By treating the issue substantively and seriously, Biden can push the media to do likewise. Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi have followed Biden's lead and have refused to say where they stand. They all look evasive and their stance plays into Republican, Republican hands by diverting attention from the outrageous midnight appointment of Judge Barrett. It also serves the Republican strategy of using the issue of court control to rally Trump's base. Kuttner's dead right about this, folks, dead right. There was a time when Republican presidents often appointed uh, the political moderates, who sometimes voted with liberals and often differed they, among themselves. In Roe versus Wade, decided by a 7-2 vote in 1973, a decision was written by Justice Harry Blackman, a Nixon appointee, with the concurrence of Nixon's Chief Justice Warren Burger. Of the two dissenters, Byron White was a Democrat, and one, William Rehnquist, by the way, a Kennedy appointee, so I, I recall correctly, it was Kennedy's first appointee, Wizzer White, and one, uh, William Rehnquist, uh, was a Republican. Yeah, you know, Wizzer White was an all-American football player. That's why he was called Wizzer White. Conversely, Democratic appointee, he was also a Rhodes Scholar. So, Conversely, Democratic, if I recall correctly, the Democratic appointees have reflected an ideological range. Stephen Breyer, who was appointed by Clinton, confirmed in 1994, by an overwhelming majority of Senate Republicans as a liberal on civil liberties, but a conservative on economic issues, the corporatist. Today's Republicans have so politicized the court that its very legitimacy is in question. Biden needs to say that he has not ruled out expanding the court, that he'll begin a process of consultation with scholars and jurists to consider several alternatives, including fixed terms for justices uh, of Fixed terms for justices, okay, mandatory retirement ages, um, and a larger court. Uh, the, the political reality is that Biden does not yet have a consensus on how to proceed, even among Democrats. With the likelihood of a closely divided Senate, he will need to build support for whatever reform project can command backing both among scholars and the citizenry and in Congress. It's time for Biden to make a virtue of necessity and address the issue of court expansion in a principled and candid fashion. Candor is in real supply these days. Voters appreciate it uh, 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 in a political leader when they see it. And Biden 
or someone on his team may have read this very column because at the town hall tonight, I saw enough of it to see Biden promise to tell the American public where he stands because they deserve to know before the election has ended on November 3rd. So maybe later on this week, he plans to make a statement or sometime next week, he plans to make a statement on where he stands on the court packing issue. He'll probably do it in the form of a major speech or something like that. So he can go into depth and explain to people what okay is going on. Now, uh, okay, in my own mind, I have, if I can get my messenger in, God, I don't know what's going on with my computer today. It is going nuts here. It's operating very slowly. The internet is. I don't know why. I have very fast internet. I'm searching here for something I wrote a little bit earlier tonight. So bear with me. I want to I want to end on that note. Maybe I can start it for you. One thing we can do with respect to the Supreme Court, apart from court packing, is that we could take uh, we could use court stripping. Um, but that is to say, we could strip the jurisdiction of the appellate courts so that they're not able to review um, any legislation related to the Green New Deal. In other words, anything that Congress uh, gives the label of the Green New Deal to, uh, could use the Article 3, Section 2 Exceptions Clause to strip uh, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court uh, from judicial review with respect to that law. Okay, now that's a radical thing to do. But it is constitutional. There's no debate over the fact that the Supreme Court has the ability to control uh, the jurisdiction of the super of. I'm sorry. The Congress has the power to control uh, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. It absolutely does. There is no argument about that. So Article 3, Section 2 is another thing that can be done um, in addition to, um, to expanding the Supreme Court. Then, of course, there's also term limits. We could use um, the term limits, though, okay, as Levitin has said, he believes um, term limits are on, uh, on, not necessarily constitutional. Uh, but we could try that anyway. And in fact, there's an easy way to make the term limits constitutional. Pass term limit laws for the Supreme Court and then use the exceptions clause to prevent the appellate courts from re reviewing the term uh, term limits laws. Uh, that is something we can do. So, that's three things 
what I've been looking for is about to come in. If my uh, internet here will give me a break. It may do that in just a couple of seconds. In the meantime, let me see what's going on with you guys. I see you're still hanging in. That's good. I'll be with you in a minute. I'm still waiting for that to come in. But I think I am there now and about to retrieve what I've been looking for. Okay, I mentioned already expanding the size of the court, and I mentioned stripping the courts of jurisdiction over certain types of cases. And I also mentioned we can impose term limits on the courts, including the Supreme Court. Four, we can also prohibit candidate justices from refusing to answer questions from senators. Okay, uh, okay right now, the candidate justices for the Supreme Court go before the senators who have the duty of advice and consent, confirmation of those particular justices, and they have the temerity to withhold information from the senators. They're under oath. They're getting direct uh, 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 questions from the senators they should be forced to answer those questions. Congress can pass laws. In fact, the Senate can pass rules prohibiting candidate justices from refusing to answer questions. Okay, on whatever grounds. The reason why I want this is because, to me, for 30 years now, these judicial confirmation hearings have been warped um, by the fact that the candidates have refused to answer certain questions on grounds that those questions may be coming up in cases before the Supreme Court uh, but soon and that they cannot judge those cases. To me, this seems to be fallacious. I mean, what the uh, 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 candidates can easily do okay, is to say, okay, you've asked me a question on this subject. Here are my current views on this subject. Now, if a case comes before me in the Supreme Court, the particulars of that case may persuade me to rule in a different way that seems inconsistent with the views I'm stating now. But you've asked me for my answer now, for my view now, for what I believe and for what okay I favor. But I'm a human being. I'm not able to predict the future. But I'm giving you as honestly as I can what my opinion is now. And you can decide whether to confirm me or not on that basis. I think that's the kind of response the candidates should be giving and that they should always give. They should never be able to say to senators, I refuse to answer your questions. Never. Never. That should automatically disqualify them for the Supreme Court. That would create much more candor in these confirmation hearings. And when candidates for the Supreme Court 
had political views that were completely inconsistent with the public, that were out of bounds, then the public would be able to see that from these kinds of the proceedings and they would be able to pressure their senators accordingly. That's what we want to happen in a democracy. We don't necessarily want these hearings uh, to be depoliticized. Then the fifth thing we could do is in line with, uh, with Levitin's uh, ideas, specifically to depoliticize, to depoliticize the Supreme Court by radically expanding uh, its size. As I said, I don't necessarily think that would be the best thing to do. Um, as Levitin says, it would be better than what we have now. Okay. I believe that, certainly. But it would not be the best thing that we could do by far. So that's what I think. I'm now going somewhat belatedly to consider your comments. Kay says, hi, all watching by the town hall. I guess I went through these at the beginning, some of these at the beginning. At 913, Kay said, my youngest daughter in Florida has to go in for an MRI next week on her head. Shake my head. Hope they don't find anything. She said way too much lately. Hope so, too. Hope so, too, Kay. Alva said, just made it. Did I miss the White House on uh, um, the Federalist uh, discussion? No, I think it's still going on, Avril, when you came. You were right about uh, Adelson, Dr. Joe. He's throwing millions to the Agoff campaign. Yeah, I know, because Adelson wants a fascist regime, uh, regime in uh, Tel Aviv. And he's got something close to that now. And Trump has been supporting that regime for all he's worth. Um, Adelson is totally in bed with Jared Kushner and with uh, Netanyahu and loves Trump because Trump is playing ball with that. He's playing ball with that. Deborah says, oops, late because cooking again. I can empathize with that. Jay says, I have known we were getting so corrupt, but even I am finding out how much worse it is than I even thought. Shake my head. Alva says, she has a creepy predatory gaze. That's for, that's for sure, um, Amy Coney Barrett. Well, I wouldn't say it's a creepy predatory gaze. It's a, I don't find it a creepy gaze. I just find it okay, an unblinking, massive focus focus gaze eating up every word okay says her father worked for shell oil company his whole life they will fight climate change action too he probably probably yep ohio started the gerrymandering shake my head i hate being stuck back here again and they're screwing with my vote here too Avril says that was on tv i regret um getting here late um, but Deborah Wilson says, I'm interested. Well, of course, you can replay that part of it. Uh, I go into Sheldon's statement completely. I read the whole thing, every word. I think I did a pretty good job of presenting it, too. Okay, I'm, you know, not allowed to play the whole thing. Can't do that. Okay, says, once you go from living in Ohio to a blue... Um, in North Carolina back in 1995, you know the different, uh, the diff way better than people that never live in another place. GOP ruined uh, North Carolina too, but I really think that came from incoming people from the North who were GOP voters. A lot of the people who went to North Carolina were Democratic voters. And Carmen Muniz, um, Carmen Muniz, also known as Avril, says, um, LATimes.com, politics story, 2020, 10, 15, Trump, Biden, town halls. Carmen gives the link. Thomas says, open smart news and read, and read Christian group hits Trump. Uh, the days of using our faith for your benefit are over. Really? That's wonderful news. I wonder when you guys are going to wake up. Open smart news and read COVID-19 cases in USA grow 
at a speed not seen since June, the start of the summer peak here. To read it on the web, tap here, Smart News link. Thank you, thank you, Carmen. That's all very good. Thank you, that's very, very good. And let's see, I scrolled down a little too fast. No to Barrett in every area. Case says town hall for Biden is just now over. He did uh, real well, in my opinion. I thought he was doing well. I had to break away um, um, at nine to start over here. But um, I thought he did very well. Uh, he didn't look like a person in cognitive decline. He did very well. Uh, Avromano says, I blame the DNC HRC due to their corruption that has brought us to this uh, uh, um, um, decimation of justice for all. I do too. I, I blame the new Democrats and Hillary Clinton and the changes that they made uh, um, um, to the party. I also blame the centrist Democrats who came into Congress. Actually, they came into Congress after Watergate. And they started making their way through the House K and uh, into the Senate. And they were fiscal conservatives. And even though some of them were anti-corporate, or at least not uh, so, uh, so pro-corporate, they did play ball with the private-public um, partnership stuff. They played ball with the Reagan administration. And they had a part into transforming the country into a market of the fundamentalist and neoliberal nation. And that, of course, is what has brought us Trump. Kay says, yes, I agree, Avro. And Kay says, uh, Kamala is now on um, um, Don Lemon. Yeah, she recently was on Rachel's show. Avro says, we just need Bonnie to go to SCOTUS hearings and whack the corrupt bastards with her magic progressive slippers. Alvaro says, I don't know what that last emoji is. Laugh out loud. I typed in magic and it was included. Steve says, keep your ears open. Whistleblower claims to have documents and tapes of U.S. government killing SEAL Team 6 to cover up phony Osama killing of the wrong guy. Oh, you mean Osama bin Laden is still alive? Oh, my God. Okay, he says, I heard that, Steve. I think that's a conspiracy theory. That's got to be a conspiracy theory. Avra says, religion just has too much influence in our government and on SCOTUS, and it's contaminating our rights and backwards dogma. Avra says, yeah, and boomers are constantly obstructing young people because they're out of touch. They are. But Kay says, not all of us boomers, Avra. Yeah. Deborah says, how on earth with our current government can this come to be? Deborah says, his mind is gone. Avril says, more squad elected. And even when he had one a mind, it wasn't amenable to any of your hopes and dreams. Maybe. Steve says, actually, Trump handled himself um, but pretty well, considering the moderator was a complete bitch. Well, that's what he gets for putting himself onto MSNBC. What the hell is he doing? He should have stayed in safe territory at Fox, but maybe Fox is against him now. Deborah Wilson says, I hope. Kay says, stop painting people such a broad brush. All boomers are not the same. I'm way more progressive than my older kids and my grandkids, too. You're right. All boomers are not uh, the same. Even though I'm, I'm not a boomer, I was born only... I don't know if it was two years or three years before the boomer generation started. I was born in 1939. I'm a pre-boomer, but not by much. But all boomers are not the same. That's right. Now, the boomers who are really worse are the ones who became the yuppies later. Steve Wolfbrand said, I've worked on... All yuppies are not the same either, though. I've got to admit that. 
Steve says, I've worked on progressive campaigns here in L.A., Kenneth Mejia and Bernie Sanders, and many of the campaign workers were boomers. Yeah, Bernie is a boomer. Yeah, Burmer, uh, uh, he is young enough at, uh, well, he's uh, 79 now. If so, he's in the very first year of the boomer generation. He was born in 1941, right? Yeah. First year of the boomers. First year of the Second World War is probably when the boomer generation dates from, of our entry into the Second World War. Of course, we didn't get in until December of 1941. Here's Bonnie. Kay says, exactly, Steve. Steve says, BRB, Dodgers losing. Oh, sorry to hear the Dodgers are losing. Now, the diff is that some of us boomers have been paying attention since we were young and have seen this country go to shit under GOP rule. And yes, the Clintons rule too. Don't forget Obama rule too. And Kay says that Clinton thing is why she lost. Avril probably a damn update. They always make the devices misbehave. Avril says, yeah, I'm still here listening and playing kitten match on my raggedy phone. Kay says, if the Clintons want to help the Dems, they both would go away and stay away. And Bonnie's wondering why my monitor is not on. Yeah. Well, my monitor is not on because when I plugged in the monitor tonight, it blacked out my screen oh. and nothing would happen. Oh. So in order to do the show at all, I had to disconnect the monitor and hope to debug it later. Okay. It might have something to do with the slow response that I've been getting here also. Yeah. I don't know why yeah. I'm getting such a slow response. I'm on the cable directly. It may yeah. just be Comcast is having a problem tonight. I don't know. If the Clintons want to help the Dems, they both uh, would go away and stay away. Steve says they should not be appointed uh, 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 unelected for life like fucking royals or something, um, in my opinion. Yeah, I believe that too. But I also believe that it would be very hard to change the Constitution. Their terms could be restricted, but I think the election part of it cannot be regulated by the Congress. They have to be appointed, as is specified in the Constitution at this time, or we have to try and change the Constitution. Now, on the average, to get a new amendment passed the Constitution, it must take something like about seven years or something like that. So, you know, maybe if we can get the Democrats to try that uh, next year, uh, yeah, that would make the Supreme Court much more responsive and much less beholden to previous political times and tempers and issues. Alvin Romano says, does Congress still work for us, though? It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it, but we have the means to make Congress work for us again if we would all simply wake up and throw the bastards out when they don't do what we want. It's easy to throw them out, just vote for other people. There's always other people to vote for. We, every one of us, if we have a lousy congressman, every one of us should be voting for someone else just for the sake of punishment. Kay says... Not under Pagosi's leadership for sure, Avril. Well, Pagosi's leadership may not last beyond the next few months. Like maybe Ro is going to challenge her, and maybe some people will have sense enough to say, hey, hey, maybe Ro will make a much better leader than Nancy. He at least can remember what went on two days ago. People in Israel are protesting Netanyahu every day. Yes, I know. Avril says, I thought Netanyahu was heading for jail. Uh, maybe, maybe he'll find a way to get out of it. You know, Netanyahu is like Trump. I mean, he's very much like Trump. He's the Trump, okay, of Israel, except I think he's a lot smarter than Trump. But uh, the point is, he'll do anything to stay in power. 
And if he's heading to jail, it was because of the criminal case, okay, against him. He may find a way to stymie that. He's been finding a way to stymie it now for years, right? Alvaro says, my pleasure, Dr. Joe. Kay says, Southeast North Carolina is a new Florida as far as uh, retirement communities go. That was when the red shift started there. Oh, I see. Alvaro says, oh, you could have done a watch party tonight with the town hall. That would have been interesting. Yeah, that's right. I could have done a watch party with the town hall. That would have been very interesting if I had done a watch party with the town hall. Hmm. I'll keep that in mind for the next time. Because if I had done a watch party with the town hall, I could have made all kinds of outrageous comments all through the town hall. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been fun? Kay says, yes, we need to do that, Admiral. I thought Agolf was on NBC. He was. Agolf was on NBC. I have no idea how Agolf did, except that I think that Avril said that he did pretty well considering his question was such a bitch, or maybe it was uh, Stephen Wolfbrand who said that. Avril said, I'm talking about the boomers in high government. No, Bernie is of the silent generation. No, Bernie uh, may not be in high government, but Bernie's a boomer if he was born in 1941. Okay, he says, I'm a younger boomer. Laugh out loud. Born in 1953. Yeah, you're a baby, Kay. You're a yeah. baby. Born in 1953. Gee. You're a spring chicken. Steve Wolfbrand said, I think boomers started when the troops came home in 1945. They caught up for lost time. No, I think they started, the boomers started when people came home on furloughs. During the war, they were coming home on furloughs. When they came home for a week or so, they never got out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the boomers started. Albert says, but you all boomers just sat back and reaped the benefits and didn't do shit. And Kay says, again, not all of us, Avril. And Steve said, the benefits started um, disappearing when Reagan got elected. That's right. And even though Reagan himself was certainly not a boomer, he got elected by the damn boomers. And the boomers bought the whole free enterprise neoliberal shtick. They did. They bought that nonsense. The pre-boomers and the people who lived uh, through the Depression would never buy that crap because they saw collectivism. That's what was going on all, th all through the Depression and during the uh, the world uh, the the World War Two period, people were working together, and they were getting huge results, and that shaped their post-war views. But then suburbanization came, and with it, people started believing in this free enterprise crap all again. That the Roosevelt administration had largely tamed. When people ended the Second World War, everybody came out with a belief in mixed economies. They did. Some people were even socialists back then. I was just, okay, Kay, what did you do to stop it as you were watching? Kay says, I protested and ruined the rest of my life by marrying my first hubby to save him from the draft. I worked for 18-year-olds to be able to vote. What have you done, Avro? <laughs> Avro says, yes, Hulk on the town hall, delicious. <laughs> okay. I've gotten to the end of the comments. Please share this as much as you can. I'm going to share it after I get off. Send a whole bunch of messages to people. I'm giving the link to this. Because everybody spent their time watching the silly town halls. Instead of watching me rant and rave about the court. Thank you very much for coming. Um, but, um, depressions make people smart, huh? Not necessarily. Okay. If the depressions are met with austerity, 
and they're met with uh, dividing people, then that doesn't give people very much experience of working together. But if people respond with a collective effort um, um, to a depression, then it makes them smart about what collective efforts can accomplish. Then they're open to things like uh, uh, cooperatives. They're more open to profit sharing, the code, uh, to uh, the co-determination, to labor unions, to strong safety nets. Alva says, I'm not a boomer, K. Steve Wolfbrand said, when I was a kid, we had portraits of FDR and JFK on the wall. It was how we rolled. Yep. And when I was a kid and the news of FDR's death um, came to my home, we all spent a good long time crying. <laughs> that was how we rolled. We loved FDR. We really did. We really loved FDR like he was a member of the family. It was really something. And the feeling was reinforced because in March of 1944, my uncle died in the war. I'm sorry. Was it March? Yeah, it was March. And in March of 1945, very close to the time, okay, my uncle died. Uh, FDR died, too. Just about one year later. So we identified those two deaths. And my uncle died when his ship was sunk in a storm off the coast of England. I'm never really clear when it was only a storm involved or whether... Um, there was a U-boat involved, too. Barbara Reed says, thank you all. Well, hi, Barbara. I didn't realize you were here. Thank you for coming. And Kate says, thank you, Joe and everyone, for another great uh, discussion. Um, I love you all. And Steve says, I think Kay has been woke from a young age and has stayed woke all her life. Yes. Didn't um, FDR put the Japanese in internment camps? Yes, he did. And it is a blot that will forever remain on his record. He had some other blots too. He was uh, not exactly free of uh, racial discrimination in his own life though he did try to ease the problem as a public problem. Uh, he was, after all, a white aristocrat. And he had many of the attitudes of such people. Nancy says, compliments me okay, on another great evening, Dr. Joe. Um, but thank you, Nancy Gosling Blackmar. And Kay says, yes, I was Steve. My mother called me an old soul, meaning I knew way more than most uh, my age. And Steve Wolfman said, uh, and my dad benefited from the WPA when he wasn't working with the circus, then fought in World War II. Yeah, so he never forgot. And he had a picture of FDR on the wall, okay. and JFK too. And JFK was himself a follower, okay, of FDR. Avram Miles said, Mech, I don't love FDR. Well, we did in my family. It was very hard to get over the feeling. I still have never gotten over it. I still am really attracted to books like uh, Harvey K is the Four Freedoms. Uh, <laughs> a lot was done in those times. A lot of changes happened. A lot of progress was made. 
and it served as the foundation for progress during the 1950s and the 1960s too. When things started going bad was when people started forgetting of the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt. So on that note, I'm going to say good night. Uh, tomorrow's Friday. I won't be back uh, but, uh, but tomorrow. I will be posting another progressive short take, however, at least one okay, progressive short take, which I've already cut. And I will see you. I will see you on Saturday night. If you want to have a Q&A on Saturday night, uh, then let me see a bunch of comments to that effect. Um, after I sign off, I'll be looking for the comments. Steve Wilprin says, FDR and Lincoln, the best presidents of all. Yeah, I kind of think that too. And Steve says, uh, good night. And Kay says, love, uh, Harvey Kay. And if there are enough of your comments, uh, then I'll do a Q&A on Saturday night. If not, I will do a regular live stream with a lengthy comment section, as I normally do. I was said, did Carter do good for the people? He tried, but he didn't do enough. Um, but Carter was politically stupid when it came to working with the people in Congress. He stupidly got on the wrong side of the unions. He wasn't very pro-union. He did not play nicely with the, uh, the unions. As a result, he lost an opportunity to pass a Medicare for All bill. He probably could have passed a Medicare for All bill if he had allied himself with Ted Kennedy and with uh, the unions backing Teddy. They could have agreed on a Medicare for All bill. They could have passed it back then. And Carter would have been a hero and he would have gotten a second term in spite okay, of Reagan, just on the strength of okay, Medicare for All. If Carter could have gotten a second term, he could have gone ahead with uh, um, his work on new energy foundations for the community and getting off of fossil fuels back then. I mean, back then, if he had, had a second term, the work he was doing on energy was terrific. The one other fly in the ointment was his stupid fiscal responsibility ideas and his constant attempts to balance the budget. He was the first president who probably, well, actually Nixon was the first president, Ford, but he could really have taken advantage of a shift to a fiat uh, currency. That would have been wonderful had he done that. It would have been wonderful if he knew enough okay, to do that and he used it to accelerate uh, what he was doing within the Department of Energy. He was doing great things in the Department of Energy. Energy Information Administration at that time was doing terrific things. I was familiar with some of the things they were doing. Some of the things that were going on at the Department of Agriculture at the time, also terrific. Carter had a lot of good instincts. He really intended to do good for people. He was probably the last president who really intended to do good things for most of the people. But he was blocked by his stupid views on fiscal responsibility and fiscal policy, and he was blocked by the fact that he had an incompetent team to work with the Congress. He had a team. His cabinet had a lot of people with great minds, a lot of people who were technically very excellent, but he didn't have the political people. He didn't, or he didn't listen to them. I'm not sure which it was. Steve says, Carter, lousy POTUS, great ex-POTUS. And uh, well, I agree. And Steve says, Carter was a micromanager as POTUS. Not good, 
but he is a great soul. And I agree to that too. He was a micromanager. He shouldn't have been a micromanager. But above all, he let his own ideology get in the way of working with Congress. He wasn't pragmatic. If he had had the pragmatism of Franklin Roosevelt and his native intelligence, his brains, his technical grasp, and if he had understood fiscal policy, he would have been one fantastic president, Jimmy Carter. One fantastic president. As it was, he's a fantastic person. There's no question about that. We were lucky to have him around. Anyway, and also, he didn't know how to build a party. He didn't know how to build a party. Franklin Roosevelt built the Democratic Party into a machine, a political machine. Carter didn't know how to do that. He didn't know how to do that. And Kennedy was pretty good at doing that kind of thing before he died. Bonnie is putting her finger on her watch, saying that she earnestly wants my company. So I'm going to say good night to you all and end this live stream. Thanks for coming. Avril says, see you Saturday night. Steve says, sweet dreams. And the broadcast. It's still ending. Everything's happening slowly tonight. I have no frickin' idea why. Tells me I'm having trouble with my internet, uh, the connection. That my Bluetooth device, my Bluetooth device is not discoverable. So it wants me to make my Bluetooth device discoverable. Discoverable. Bluetooth devices, let's see. It says it's starting it. I am having network problems. I have to do something about that. Meanwhile. Can I go to the back now? No. We're still on. Let me have one of, of my screwdrivers back there. You see the little screwdrivers? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks.
definitely connected by cable now. So let's see if this will finally end. It's just not ending. I don't know why. Nope. Not successful in ending the broadcast. 